Hello, everybody. Now it's 4.20. Let's get started again. So hope you did have a little break. So now we have four more presentations, right? So they will be related to the use of tech. Technology, as I said earlier, it's not only this session, but this session they really will share with us um, lots of ideas using technologies in relation to curriculum design and materials development. So let's first of all, we have Johanna from PolyU to talk with us about the e-reading platform. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen all right, my presentation? Yes. All right, wonderful. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, perusal, uh, turning challenges into opportunities and how I used perusal uh, during online learning, but found that I think it's a great opportunity and something I will continue doing when we go back to class to class teaching. So first of all, what is perusal and how does it work? Well, it's basically just a, a pretty simple collaborative reading uh, platform, uh, but they have added features like uh, videos and podcasts, so we can also watch and listen to various media. The way it works uh, is pretty much uh, the instructor creates a course, uh, uploads various materials, and then creates assignments based on those materials. Uh, the students then read the text, annotate them, or watch videos, listen to podcasts, and annotate them. Uh, and perusal, the system, sort of tracks all this activity. And the way I've used it is for asynchronous preparation before a lesson uh, and then uh, with face-to-face -face follow up online. Uh, I've also done, though, uh, less uh, frequently, like synchronous in-class activities, for example, uh, genre analysis of a text or something like that. Um, so basically, it's very, very easy to use. You create a course, uh, and one of the benefits is you can copy a course. So if you have several sections or from one semester to the next or to share with your colleagues, it's also very easy for students to enroll. Uh, once you've got your course, uh, you go to your library and you add whatever content uh, you want. Uh, I normally use just PDFs uh, from my computer. Uh, I copy materials from another course. Uh, I have uploaded videos uh, and that works very nicely, uh, or rather uh, YouTube links. Uh, I've never tried the podcasts and something that's new that I'm super excited about is the student upload folder, uh, which I think could be very useful for peer feedback because, you know, uh, before when it was the instructor only who could upload, it would have been quite time consuming uh, to, to have student work up there. So anyway, you, you get your library going, then you add your assignments. And you can see here in my course, I have a number of assignments. Uh, you describe what you want the students to do. Uh, you set various settings. Uh, and then this is something what the, what the students will see. They have the text uh, in the center. In the bottom, what is it? Bottom right hand corner, you have the, uh, the description, the instructions, which you can close that uh, window. Uh, and then you can see the conversations. So each little green uh, tick is a comment that someone has made, and you can click on them to, to, to read more. Uh, if you look at the main page, uh, you can see that some text is highlighted in yellow. Those are all the things that students have highlighted and then made a co uh, comment on. The blue is the stuff that I've highlighted and made a comment on because before I set the assignment, I, I usually seed the text with some questions or the type of comments that I kind of want the students to make. Once the students have been working on this assignment, you can, uh, you can see the progress. Uh, so this, is, this view shows the overall assignment progress, uh, and you can see how many comments have been made on the assignment. Uh, you get a, an overview of how many students have you know, spend how much time, you know, um, and there's a little more detailed information, you know, you can vote, you can click on annotations, you know, if you like them and so on. And you can also see the students who have been very active. But it's also po uh, possible to, to go into your student list and see what each student has done. So if you look at the top uh, of the, the right hand side, you see the total of comments 
and the total of time spent by a, a specific student uh, on all the assignments. But then if you look underneath, it says assignment one, and what comes below that is this student's participation in that specific assignment. So it's very easy to get an overview of what everybody does. Um, so the question then is why use perusal? Um, like Francis before, uh, when I uh, you know, submitted my uh, little proposal to this uh, session, I wasn't sure where, whether I should do it as a technology tool or student motivation because my, my initial motivation was really mainly the motivation, the student motivation. I think that perusal is great because it works both as a carrot and a stick. You know, students like, or at least some students, they like to engage they like other students to see their comments. They like to see other students' comments. Um, but it's also a bit of a stick because I tell the students that even though I make their annotations anonymous, that's a setting that you can choose or not, I can certainly see exactly who has said what. I can see exactly how many minutes they spent on reading, not just having the document open, but actually engaging with the text. Um, so. You know, like even though it's not graded in, in our center, some students care <laughs> what, what it looks like. I also thought during uh, the pandemic and online teaching that it's a collaborative reading mode. Um, even if they're doing it asynchronously, they're kind of interacting. They're not just sitting at home by their computers reading on their own. It's kind of like engaging with classmates, even if it's asynchronously. And then of course I can monitor, the instructor can monitor not just because you want to you know see who's good and who's bad but you want to be able to see have students understood things what are the difficulties the comments they make is there anything that i need to spend more time on is anything unclear and so on so if this pandemic ever you know goes away um these three uh rationales for using perusal are still there i think it's still very you know motivating it still promotes interaction and it's still very easy for me to, to monitor. But I think also uh, I found that there are much better participa uh, participation and completion rates with perusal than without. Uh, so I'll definitely continue using it. I also think that many of us were very uh, involved in like blended learning and the flipped classroom approach before the pandemic. But I think many of our universities are even more interested in this. So I think perusal is the perfect tool you know, pre-class, during class, and then you have all the records afterwards, students can go back and see everything. So it, it works very well for, for, for blended, the blended mode. The analytics are also excellent. Um, you can, uh, you get data on everything really. Uh, and it can be linked to, to grades as well. And it can be linked to certain LMSs directly. And then, as I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, it's incredibly easy to, to share courses so if we're thinking about what a center can do to, to make our lives easier, it's possible to have a course where this uh, tool is built in uh, and it's shared with between all the sections. Or uh, colleagues can share materials, can share courses with each other. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a really excellent tool all around. Um, I did a, a survey with uh, three of my classes who used this. And I'm not going to go into details here, but I think overall the, the perception of using perusal was quite positive. Uh, even the ones who said that perusal did not make them uh, feel prepared for lessons did say that it made them think more deeply about text. So uh, overall, I think it's a pretty positive uh, response. Uh, if any of you are interested in trying it out, you can create an account, it's very easy. You go to perusal.com. Uh, if you do this, make sure that you uh, log on as instructors or enroll as instructors because otherwise your access is going to be uh, a little bit strange later. And um, if you want to try a course, uh, I've, I've created one that you can have a look at um, just to see what the student uh, view is like. Uh, I will put this code uh, in the chat later. Uh, yes, and the PowerPoint has some links here. And, and that's all for me. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, Johanna. Just about time. OK, thank you so much. And uh, if there are questions, please put in the chat box. Now let's hand over to the next group of presenters, Amy and Lorena from CAES Hong Kong U. So they're going to share with us their experience uh, in the last uh, year or so about um, the space and the time that they think about or we think about um, using technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Right. Uh, our topic today is rethinking educational time and space for the post COVID classroom. My name is Amy Xu, and I'm here with my colleague, Lorena Li. Uh, Lorena Li, we are two novice teachers who spent nearly our entire teaching career at HKU online. So you could say that Zoom has become our natural habitat. But fortunately enough, Last semester, we both received, we received top student ratings in two different courses we taught and congratulations letters from our director as well. So if we were working in a tutoring center, you would probably see our faces very soon on a bus somewhere. Okay, hopefully this will give you a bit of confidence in the teaching practices that we're about to share today. Uh, okay, so what I was saying just now is that I'm just going to start with a very quick trip down memory lane of everything that has happened in the past two years. So in November 2019, when classes were cancelled, I think uh, the natural reaction for many of us was to continue doing what we had been doing so far, but remotely. So everyone learned how to use Zoom or Microsoft Teams or something like that to deliver our lessons. We put all our materials in drives and you start LMS, we sent emails and then we just hope for the best. But then of course, very quickly, uh, fatigue set in, many of our students disappeared. Uh, some were clearly struggling and we just couldn't see another screen full of little black boxes. It seemed that maybe as much as we try to keep going, uh, I think many of us realized that just doing the same wasn't going to work. So of course we blamed everything that was happening, um, social unrest, the pandemic, um, remote learning, our students, our lack of experience, construction work in our buildings, everything. And of course, all of that had an impact in, in just how difficult the situation was. But we think that there was also something potentially wrong with the way we were doing things and the pandemic just exposed that. Um, I think listening to, to many of you, I think we can agree that the type of teaching and learning that we were experiencing before COVID was for the most part convenient. And it relied on the agreement that spending a number of hours in a specific place would result in learning. And this was kind of working because of this agreement that we all had and, and the results that we were achieving. So institutions were growing. Um, we were doing our jobs, students were graduating, everything was, was going well. But I guess the question here is, were we really learning and were we excited about it? And I'm not saying necessarily 100% we weren't, because the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. But what we were thinking while we were planning this presentation is that if we are not cautious, we might just slip back into our old routines and continue doing what was convenient uh, and just miss this opportunity to not necessarily do more, more fancy tech tools, Mentimeter, Kahoot, uh, share documents, but to do different. And again, just listening to everyone, I feel that many of us agree that two things that um, in different ways we plan to do different are time and space. So the first perspective we're going to take to look at post-COVID classroom teaching is time. What if we continued using a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning that will keep reducing our cognitive load, uh, not just the load, the workload of us teachers, but also of students as well. So I know that a lot of us may be worried about how students are not going to do the work before class, but in reality, students surprise us once they're on board with our mission. Right, so the image you see on the screen is an example of a reflection activity that I frequently did with my students. And I guess the time shift here was giving away some of my lecturing time to students for them to just engage in discussion and reflection. As you can see from this one example, uh, participation was quite active. 
And I do think that activities like these ones enhance what we were doing independently. And they also enhance the, the engagement that we were having. Uh, my engagement with the, the human beings that I was meeting in, in class, their needs, their motivations, their expectations, uh, their engagement with the human that I am who gets delivery packages every time is in class. And the engagement with the, the people, the other, the classmates and all the activities that really push learning and not just keep us spending time or being busy. So how has it worked in my case for the past semester? Here is the student participation rate I pulled out from Moodle during the teaching input weeks. The same course with three groups of students. So as we can see, the second semester, uh, predictably, there was some fluctuation in the participation rate. But if we zoom in and look at the lowest point of participation, uh, there still 14 out of 18 students would have contributed to forum posts or submitted their responses to the concept checking questions. So I wouldn't say it's a bad number. Uh, if we think about in face-to-face -face class where we have 18 students in the same room, it would probably be harder to gauge whether or not they are engaged or on task. So because of doing so, I was able to start each lesson with some data from the class. So as you can see on the right-hand side in this screenshot, uh, I was able to see which students were struggling with what particular concept, uh, and I was able to start the lesson exactly where the students were. What if we continued this approach of assigning them some asynchronous tasks where the progress or the outcomes like this are visible to us? And what if we let go of some of the good old warmers uh, and some of the elicitation that we're used to uh, and started this lesson with some genuine communication instead? Um, pedagogically, display questions, which means the, the questions of which the teacher already knows the answer, can be quite mechanical and restricting for learning to take place. Right. And in terms of space, we would like to envision a post-COVID classroom where in-classroom activities and online learning uh, can be combined. And so we can help students who are just different types of learners. So our analogy here was exercising. So some of us are maybe very motivated and we can exercise anytime, anywhere. But some of us need the structure of a gym. We need a coach. We need a team around us, encouraging us. Um, and this doesn't mean that either type is better at exercising or in our case, learning. It's just that we are different. So I think now that just by listening to everyone, we are much more comfortable with online teaching and learning. And we've seen how much time and resources we can save. Uh, I think it, it'd be a good idea to continue finding those spacious, spaces that allow a bit more iteration, that give more time for students who need it, that allow for different formats and so not only the outspoken students can benefit from the activities that we prepare. And that just allow us to just be a bit more graceful and understand that sometimes life gets in the way. Um, some people need flexible deadlines. Some students need more regular checks. And we definitely need more training in the use of technology and information so, so we can solve problems like COVID just now. Uh, so here's an example of an activity that would normally happen in the classroom. So this was a speaking tutorial that was moved from the classroom to Vox, a platform that we use here at HKU. Don't mind the platform. This is basically what Jessica did just using OneDrive is the same concept. And so in this activity, um, what I'd like you to notice are two things. The first one is the number of times that this, this one video was played, which is something that is not practical in a physical classroom and the discussion that sometimes because of the different personalities and anxieties that meet in a classroom wouldn't happen naturally, I don't think. So another quick example that uh, I used in my classes were also kind of mentioned by Catherine as well. I used pre-recorded videos under six minutes, which is what I perceived as a comfortable attention span for students. Uh, so that they could have the autonomy to choose the physical space, whether it's on MTR or in the park or in their bedroom, uh, and also the mental space for their own learning. And this is what students have said. 
I can pause and play at any point I feel doubt and jot notes. Uh, looking at the Moodle backend data, you could also see with challenging topics like critical stance, counter arguments, there are a lot more views and students were able to revisit the content quite frequently uh, and less so with the less challenging topics. Right, so I think our time is up. Uh, so, yeah, just thank you for listening. We are very hopeful for the future. So, yeah. Good thank luck you. to everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have a bit of time for discussion in a while. Okay, now let's hand over to the third group. So this is the group of colleagues from the same program with the program coordinator and two core team teachers. Let's hand over to, that, to them. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lillian. Um, so uh, I am Keith Child, and we have our course coordinator, Patrick Leung, and our course member, team member, Serena Chen. So the topic of our presentation is surviving online teaching through new practices. What have we learned? Um, basically, uh, before we share our experiences, um, I would like to share uh, our uh, experience, I, I would like to introduce our courses first. So basically, um, we offer four courses for students um, during their programs in the Faculty of Education. And um, actually, we, we didn't have much uh, changes to our course component uh, during the COVID situation. Um, we still have uh, the reading components, the writing components, and the speaking components. But of course, we have um, made some adjustments on the assessment or the grading criteria to cope with the online teaching purposes. So for the reading components, we try to show them with um, some journal articles and some examples on proposal literature review and reflective essays. So basically, um, all the examples are related to the assessments. And for the uh, writing components, uh, we are trying to um, design some assessment uh, which is relevant to the uh, major studies, like uh, the writing of a project proposal, um, an example of the literature review, um, a draft of the project report, and sometimes we may ask them to produce a reflective essays uh, to show them, uh, to show us what they have learned in our courses. So for the speaking components, um, I think before or during the COVID situation, we use more or less the similar uh, speaking component, like individual presentation, group presentations. And for both, we have uh, peer assessment inside. So in the following section, um, our colleague, my colleague, uh, Patrick and Serena will share some of our experiences. So maybe let me pass the time to Patrick and Serena. Right. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about one practice that we try to implement um, in the education ED courses that we've been running in the past few semesters. So the first one is some pre and post videos and some self-study materials. So as mentioned by Keith just now, um, we do have a pretty heavy reading load in the course because um, the students are asked to write research reports. So we do have to show students some samples so that they know how to, how, what, what an effective text is like. Um, in online lessons, I think we all have experienced that it can be very demanding if we are sitting in front of a computer for three hours. So what we've done is we tried to film some short videos, bite-sized videos like what Amy did. Uh, we tried to divide the videos into smaller sections. So instead of asking students to read some of the text in class, we've shifted some of the tasks outside class. So for example, uh, we when we are teaching them like a conclusion section of a research report, we ask students to take a look at some articles in the course booklet first or some sample articles. And then we pre-recorded a video taking the students through the different stages or some of the linguistic expressions that are typical in the conclusion section. So we get students to watch some of the videos in class and then in the live sessions, so we discuss the text in greater details, we discuss the text with students and answer any questions that they have. Um, apart from just a general discussion on the features or the purpose of a particular section, then we also do detailed analysis of authentic articles. Again, this can be a very heavy reading load for the students, so we um, shifted some of these outside class times so that students can do all these in their own time. So when they're free, then they can just watch some of these videos. Um, 
before the pandemic, we do a lot of these in class. But now, um, after um, after students watching these videos, um, they've, we've got some pretty good feedback from the students that they are finding good to review some of these materials outside class time. And then um, I'm going to show you some statistics um, that shows the views of the students. And this might also tell us something as course teachers and also course developers. Um, some of, so apart from the videos, we've also produced some self-study materials that we annotated um, the text to show students like the linguistic expressions, the move analysis, like the rhetorical structures, so that they do not necessarily have to watch the videos. They might, if they choose, if they want, then they can just read some of the materials as well. Um, this is the stat that I've talked about. Um, I just took this yesterday, and these you can see some views here. So they are in May, and these are actually the days before the assessment deadline. So what we've noticed is that students do go back to the videos and try to refresh their memory or to try to see or recap what they have learned. I think uh, these videos do have a role to play. And go, thinking about the post-COVID classrooms, uh, since the videos are there already, uh, perhaps we as course developers can also think about a flipped approach as to whether or not we can make better use of the class time to discuss um, the issues with the students um, so that they can shift some of the bore, relatively boring reading tasks at home and so that we can make more useful and meaningful use of the time to do some discussion or to do some writing practice. So this is the first practice that we have uh, experimented and now Serena will be sharing with us another strategies that we have adopted. Uh, thank you, Patrick and Keith. So uh, I'm now going to share the second practice, uh, making use of some interactive teaching tools. Um, these tools are not something brand new. Uh, I expect everyone will know that uh, about use of Moodle, Kahoot, Mentimeter, and Google Doc. And due to the time limit, I'm going to share some um, experience that we have by using the Kahoot and Mentimeter and whether we can continue uh, implementing them, using them when we go back to face-to-face -face teaching. So speaking of Kahoot, um, sorry, um, I figure out that we can make use of Kahoot to check students' understanding. Uh, just like what Keith mentioned, students have to produce a research report. Then at least we have to check whether they understand what research gap, what research objective is. And we can also make good use of Kahoot, this very simple game like true false question to consolidate students' learning, like to check whether they really understand the purpose of writing the particular section or the method section, something like that. And speaking of the Mentimeter, uh, other than the functions I've mentioned, um, I've also experimented to check students' prior knowledge before actually providing some teacher input. Like as I've mentioned, students have to uh, write a research report and actually students have to actually conduct a qualitative interview based research. And um, as we know that stu uh, the students taking this course is just a year two students, they might not have a very good understanding about what research is. Then we can try to make use of Mentimeter to check their prior knowledge, what research actually means to that. At least they know that there should be citation, there should be references, something like that. And other than that, we also make use of our mentee to consolidate students' learning, like how to identify research gap, and for example, checking students' learning progress as well. And I just like to end our presentation very quickly by showing you some students' feedback that we have collected. As you can see on my slide right now, um, quite positive students' feedback. Uh, they find it fun, interesting, However, we also have to pay attention to, like, for example, this is quite an interesting comment for Menti. Sometimes there were no ideas in students' mind. So that might be something we have to think about that. Uh, I think time is up. So uh, that's all for our sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for the whole team's presentation. Now let's move on to the last one, uh, Patrick Deloche, also from CAES Hong Kong U. So he will be sharing with us a course that was emerged during this time. So Pat, your time. Um, yeah, 
Can you all hear me okay? Can you hear me? No audio? <laughs> Is no, it, not it's, really. Uh, oh, we can I'm, hear the construction. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I had hoped Very it noisy had, it, background. I, I had hoped it might stop before now. I apologize. I'll try to speak loudly. So I'm going to be talking today about a course that I've developed over the pandemic called Online Digital Storytelling in English. Now, my experience began actually as far from online as you might imagine. Um, I had been coordinating a course called Nurturing Global Leaders. And in that course, we were spending eight weeks in the summer intensively teaching English uh, in Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia. So I was sending students off to villages in Myanmar where they were living in bamboo huts and teaching English. So when the pandemic came along, you might imagine that it was quite a challenge. But in fact, I think that what we found is that there were a lot of opportunities. And so one of the assessments that we had been using before uh, the pandemic was digital stories. And it's, it's a uh, a methodology that I've been getting into more for uh, summative reflective assessment. Um, and so the experience, what we did is that we developed a new course called CAS 2002, Online Digital Storytelling in English. This new course, what we do is that we spend six weeks teaching them the uh, digital storytelling methodology. So they go through the process of learning about digital storytelling firsthand. They make their own digital stories. And then in the second six weeks of the course, in the second half, the students are actually consolidating what they've learned about digital storytelling. And they're delivering workshops to learners in Myanmar. And so all of our students have their own classes. It's typically small group, sort of one student, one Hong Kong youth student to three learners in Myanmar. And, and they go through this process of helping students develop digital stories, which are based on personal narratives. Now, these personal narratives, the idea of tell us a story, a true story about yourself from your life, really help to kind of bridge that gap in terms of the cross-cultural uh, relationships that we wanted them to develop. Now, when it was immersive, those relationships developed naturally. Online, the digital storytelling methodology seems to work really well to get them engaged in kind of figuring out what are the people on that side really all about. So the assessments in the course are all pretty digital. They make a digital story in the first half. They develop a learning object. The learning object is really kind of a, a multimodal text that helps their learners figure out how to make uh, digital stories. They create a, a reflective vlog, and then finally they're assessed on their online engagement, which is really mostly about what they've done in terms of their own teaching. So the, I think the interesting thing about this approach is that it's not a sort of situation where we're coming in and saying, where does online fit in? It's really a case where we're looking at online delivery and we're saying, what can we do with online even outside of face-to-face? -face? And this is something where it wouldn't work face-to-face. -face. And so um, firstly, one of the key uh, uh, communication skills that we want the students to acquire through this experience is to develop online communication and digital literacy skills. And so by kind of working online, we're actually fostering that. The, the course taps into the acceptance for online engagement that only came about because of COVID. So this is something that would have been really impossible before because the learners on the other side, had we said, hey, let's learn online, there just wouldn't have been acceptance from people in Myanmar in the developing world. And so this is something that's only possible because of COVID. Um, in the past, when we had students go off to Myanmar, the real challenge that they had to try to overcome was just living in that country. In this new approach, rather than having that challenge of living in the country, the challenge that they face is how do we deliver online learning 
to students who are in the developing world. So we've got all kinds of technical problems to overcome versus the sort of logistical problems that we would have had to overcome in the past. And then finally, after the students finish this course and they've taught others how to develop their own digital literacy skills, we give them an opportunity to apply to become peer consultants within the center in the digital literacy lab. So if they're good, they can apply those same skills and get a job after the end of the course. So just real quickly, I think I've gone through a lot of the differences. We started with a 12 credit summer intensive. Now we've moved to a six credit course that runs during the semester. And so it can be done at the same time as their other studies. Um, the, the teaching in the past where the students would go and they teach at a, a community partner organization, the language that they taught was really based on the partner organization. What did that organization need? Now we've got this kind of established methodology in digital storytelling, which can be standalone, but can also integrate with the curriculum of the partner organizations. Um, in the past, the language skills were, could be kind of whatever that they needed on that side. Now it's spoken, visual, and digital literacies that we're focusing on. Um, and I think I've already talked about the logistical versus the uh, kind of technical limitations that we faced. So I think in the end, um, it feels like it was a difficult course to put together, but it's, it seems like based on our first runs that the students quite liked it. Um, course require active participation. The students, uh, the mean was 97.7. So students were definitely getting engaged, stimulated them to be creative, 90.9, uh, had assessment that helped them learn, 95.5. Um, and then finally, the course effectiveness was 93. So I was really happy with uh, those numbers. So just a couple of things before I finish. Um, online programs, I think, uh, can be better suited for some teaching objectives. This is one of those cases where I'd, I feel like we just couldn't do the same things face to face. And so it's, it's really not a case of substitution. But at the same time, online programs, I believe, can really complement face-to-face. And in this case, we have existing experiential learning courses, which this one complements. In the past, when we had a partner organization, we could only visit them for eight weeks in the summer. Now we have the potential to be able to engage with that partner organization, both in the summer as well as during the semester. And it should make our face-to-face -face presence uh, better. And finally, um, going online can make engagement that wouldn't otherwise be possible. This is something that, you know, we couldn't reach out to Myanmar mid-semester in the past, but here we are now. So that's my eight minutes. I'm happy to answer any questions when our time comes. Great, thank you, Pat. Right, okay, we have one question there really for you, Pat, about your presentation uh, slides and you <laughs> showing yourself within the slides. Can you answer that question, <laughs> please? Uh, I, can't, I can't see the chat room. Um, so me... how, how did you put yourself in the presentation slides? Uh, you mean, how did I do that? Mm. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the it's complicated. Um, it, this is actually a hardware solution, but the only way to do it with a, a purely software solution is using software called OBS. Um, it is possible with software only, but I'd have to do a, a longer presentation than eight minutes to answer that question. Right, okay. But, but I'd be happy, I would be very happy at some point to do that if, if people are interested. Mm, yeah, we got two questions there both asking about the same question. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, are there other questions for this uh, group of colleagues? Johanna, maybe I ask you one question first. So when you use that um, uh, pursuit, did you use it with um, like the whole class uh, on the same document or like uh, in, in small groups? 
Um, thank you. Um, I used it, uh, the same document with the whole class because my class size was uh, a maximum of 22. Mm. Um, so I thought that that worked fine uh, from the beginning, but it's possible to set to divide your class into groups so that they can only see the, the comments made within their groups, depending on what you're uh, what you think. Is best. Yes. Mm, OK, thank you. Right. Are there other questions? I think there's there's one from Miranda for me. 447 ah, views from 20 students. Mm. Um, I think, uh, as I was saying, maybe because uh, CUE students, which means core university English, is the, a course we offer for first year students in Hong Kong U. I guess they, they struggle with counter arguments a lot. Uh, I included that screenshot because we wanted to show how uh, students to constantly go back and check the challenging topics. It is definitely interesting, the statistics. Thank you, Amy. Right. Other questions or comment, feedback? Mm. Ah. Yes, I do have a little. Mm -hmm. when, when yeah, um, maybe not so much teaching related, but uh, what I saw in the past that uh, students' participation is, in, is not so stable until the last moment, you know, when assessment comes at the end of the term, and they are always like project or upcoming assignments from other courses. They have all sorts of excuses to, you know, for to, to, to make their participation very fluctuate. So I, I doubt whether during the um, pandemic time, and they have more, uh, you know, off screen, off screen, uh, uh, you know, um, participation in doubt because um, they they never really show up. Although they they may put up a picture and then they off to something, and, and do their own thing. So I, I doubt whether uh, during the pandemic time. Teachers will have um, control method to, to know the participation and make sure that it's a fair, you know, a fair play. I doubt. Mm -hmm. yes. I hope pe people understand what I'm trying to to raise up or a question about. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yes. Right. Any further comment on Wendy's point or any other feedback? If uh, just, just a uh, question for Johanna, um, how many courses are using that Peruso? Um, I used it mostly. Well, I used it with uh, both of my courses uh, last semester, but I I used it much more in one course because it was very text heavy. It was an advanced reading and writing course, so it was particularly good. But I've also used it sort of more in a more limited way, a couple of lessons in another uh, course for more genre analysis. Oh, but what, what about for the other colleagues um, at PolyU? Well, Do they have, actually use it? I have one colleague, um, Ryan Hunter, uh, who's using it. Uh, he's the one who introduced me to it. Um, so he's been using it for several uh, semesters in, in a number of different courses. And I think we're in agreement that it works. It works for almost every, anything, to be honest. Mm. And um, it's not actually hard to use, but if you make it part of your course, the students, you know, like they, as somebody said before, they become very familiar with the tool, and it becomes very natural how to use it. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. We have another about um, well, 25 minutes. I think we do have time to let's go into a breakout group uh, for say uh, 10, 10 minutes of sharing. I guess you might like that opportunity to talk to and hear from colleagues from other centers. And uh, there is a little Padlet. Um, there are a few points there based on the our overall questions uh, uh, in the program. So you may choose one to um, put in some thoughts there in your um, group discussion. And uh, after the 10, maybe about 
10 minutes, yeah. 10 minutes, we'll come back here and we could look at a Padlet or some of you could raise questions from your, um, from your group discussion, all right? So let's get into small groups to make good use of this chance to uh, hear more from colleagues. Because just now we had really excellent sharing from our 15 percent presenters and we really got quite a lot of uh, inspiration, I think, and insight and their reflections. So I'm sure everybody also has something to say. And uh, let's look forward and see what uh, we can really learn from each other. So let's say 10 minutes from now. So um, Lucas, are you ready for us? Right, okay, um, yeah. thank you. All right, so let's go into the room and come back at um, 5.16. Please use the Padlet link. So one group only got two there. Maybe you have, you should move. Yeah, yeah, I'm moving them to another room. Yeah. Okay. So one group got all CAES people. Uh, see. Room five. Oh, yeah. Let's move one. One, one uh, but be quick. Together. Yes, thanks. Maybe two. But please, quick. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Move somebody to room five from another university. Move. Now room five or Hong Kong U. I mean, you have to be quick because they're starting to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just came back, so I'll join room sex now. Thanks. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. I was in the washroom. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. This is not good. I mean, two minutes. Uh, I... Can you just move, move? Move somebody from room six or leave them there, leave them there. Anyway, leave them there. <laughs> yeah, leave them, there. Find... leave them there. Leave them yeah. there, leave them Because it's not good to move people around yeah, 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 when yeah. they are talking. I just found one link that Patrick, how, how they can, how he can set up the, himself in the PowerPoint slide. Well, you, you can send it to everybody when they come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought Adam showed something. Yeah, I, I sent it to him and then let him to share. Oh, so he's, he shared that already, right? Uh, yeah, but here is another one better. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can share. Yeah. So uh, I may go into one group. I'm not sure whether I can come out. Uh, uh, yeah, I said, you can. You can. You can leave anytime. I. Yeah, I can leave anytime. I'm sh I'm sh saying whether I can join another group. Anyway, so the time is I said 
five sixteen, is it? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'll be with Pat and Adam and Keith. Oh. Okay, um, you call people back, all right, when it is time's up. Okay, say one, one, one minute left and then after that one minute, you call people back. That means at 5.15, you call people back. Yeah, we'll yeah. Say one minute left. Do you know how to do that? Yeah, 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 not, yeah. Not, you broadcast and then, and then uh, to call people back, say one minute left and then uh, take them back. Yeah. Okay. okay, right. I'll go into room four then. Thanks. Maybe I should pop into another another group. In fact, not many CAS people. I will join three.
Sorry, the earliest. Right, we are back here. Um, good, maybe not too much time, but at least you heard from each other for a while. Just now I went into a group, we were saying that some, some centers uh, said that university hasn't decided whether they will go back to the physical classroom, maybe hybrid, maybe uh, don't know yet, or, on, or online. So that might be a question that you would like to talk about or share now or any, main uh, issues or comment that um, came up just now with your discussion in small groups? Any group, anybody would like to raise some point here? We could also look at not many comments in the, in the um, uh, Padlet, but uh, uh, I guess because of the time, but could also have a look. So anyone, any? I have a feeling that probably all universities are going to be doing hybrid teaching in the coming, coming year, because even though they want to go back to face-to-face, -face, you look realistically, can all students come back to Hong Kong and do face-to-face? -face? So they have to cater for students online. And uh, while at the same time trying to go back to face-to-face -face teaching, I don't think any university has, has announced it yet officially, but... We have at Hong Kong oh. U. But yeah. Yeah, 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 Hong Kong U Leif said they want to do face to face. What about those students who cannot come back for face to face? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's that would be my yeah. question. Like, yeah. I think I think I think at UST we're going to have some sections which are going to be online for the bigger courses. I think that's mm -hmm. the idea. Like mostly it's going to be going. But the idea is to go back face to face, but keep some sections online for those students who can't come back. That's my understanding but, anyway. But then when, when it comes to uh, exam and assessment, if that could be a problem, because we have heard about reports of um, getting someone to help with the exams, right? Okay, that, that, that happens for CityU at the beginning. They said they want to have a face-to-face -face exam. Yeah, what, what the students care about are marks and the grades, but assessment will play the most important part, whether they want to come back and yeah, do the assessment or not. Assessment, like even if we have online and face-to-face, -face, we'll have the same assessment for all students. So basically we'd have to have all the assessments online still because we can't have students, some students doing an online assessment, other students doing a face-to-face -face assessment. We need parity. Mm. So the only way we can think about doing that is to have it all on, like continue be assessments online, even if, some of some students are going face to face. But there's so so much leeway that the students can play with when it comes to the online assessment. Huh? Well, well, like we've, yeah, we've, learned, know, yeah. we've learned a lot in the last year yeah, about how to conduct yeah. online, and we like we integrate consultations with it, so there's less chance of cheating. They they need to tell us about their essay, and they need to go to consultation, show us her plan. So I, I've heard from mm -hmm. another university, the lecturer from really uh, statistics, mathematics, they already have been planning how to conduct the hybrid mobile with the use of the uh, sort of like iPad where you can uh, write on that electronic board on the iPad so that you get project to the screen with people in the um, classroom and also to the online audience because it's really difficult. I've never tried that myself to do hybrid in a classroom. Have you? Try that one. A hybrid is ext extremely challenging. I think it's everyone would extremely agree. Extremely you... challenging to please if, the if online got... audience and the live audience, right? 
I'm in my office. I have people coming to my door now and I'm trying to say, talk to them and talk to me, to you lot online. It's impossible. You cannot do it. You cannot I mean, like deal with USD, two sets of people. Yeah, like, like USD, it would make sense if you put some people in, um, people who choose opt the online yeah. here at the classroom and here at the face-to-face. That's, I think, the, the best arrangement, yes. That, that could be the best arrangement. So, so any uh, plans yet from any centers about, uh, you know, planning that for September? center depends on the senior management. Yes. We're waiting. <laughs> we wish they could be as proactive as Hong Kong U and say, this is what we're going to do. We're waiting. If you do not come you. back, you do not continue with us. Okay, that would be good. Sure. No. No. Then how? We don't how, know. We don't know. Right. But we, we should make good use of the summertime, right? Uh, uh, what we can anticipate and, and get ourselves prepared a bit. I, I think some of the university is waiting for some other, other to make the decision and then <laughs> follow that. Is it? Yeah, I think that would be, that would happen. If Hong Kong U, okay, or CU or USD have made the decision that okay, you all have to come back, otherwise, I mean, you you can just, I mean, delay and suspend for one year of study, then people will come back, or you you will have a different assessment than the normal group. Mm-hmm. Well, Hong Kong U put out a very public message mm. maybe two weeks ago now, so yeah. basically very hard line stating every everyone will need to come back. Mm. Has, there been, be, has there been I, any I, pushback okay. for that, Miranda? Any advice uh, from yeah. students? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there are lots of questions mm. that haven't been answered. So questions about will will we have any social distancing in the classroom? Uh, that mm-hmm. hasn't been answered. And then the big question that a lot of teachers uh, are asking but isn't answered is about compulsory quarantine. What happens if a if a student in someone's classroom is uh, tested positive? Will mm-hmm. all the teachers and all the students have to go into co- compulsory quarantine? So that's the big question I think that most people have. Those two questions, and there's no response yet to those questions. A Hong Kong U campus in Penny Bay. Yeah, that'll be interesting. <laughs> Twelve thousand <000 students. laughs> students. See how they cope with that. Yeah. Have we heard about any, I mean, overseas university, what is the, what would be their plan for next year? I mean, I think a lot of face-to-face, certainly in the yeah. US. Um, a lot, some u, uni, universities in the US are requiring compulsory, compulsory vaccination. Mm-hmm. Um, Hong Kong U has, has come out and said people are strongly encouraged to be vaccinated, but they've not gone the step of, of make it compulsory apart from in residential halls. Mm. I don't know what it's like in other places. The same. Mm. But strongly encouraged. Yeah. Recommended. But uh, I think in some of the U- US university compulsory uh, uh, have a system that allows students to upload their resignation record to make sure who can mm. do face to face. And everyone is expected to be fully vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any from any other groups? Oh, uh, similar in that group. Two from Hong Kong music the same. And uh, we also talk about the size of the classrooms. So sometimes social distancing is not possible in language classes. Think about like you have to stay away from someone two meters and you're practicing conversation or discussion. Mm. Yeah, I suspect we'll have a whole new set of challenges, especially, you know, teaching a skills based class when you're in a mask. Or you are socially distanced from some someone else. So I mean, there are a whole new set of challenges for us as language teachers. So how are we going to deal with that? What 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 techniques might we use for that? I think that's something that needs needs to be thought about. 
Mm. Yeah, it might be even more challenging because it might be some sort of trying to be in the classroom, but still some students, maybe some teachers who can't be in the classroom. So it might be even more challenging. That might, it seems that that might be to some extent a hybrid mode of uh, teaching. Yeah, so. not necessarily hybrid mode in the same class, but uh, we talk a lot about the new norm. Um, so one possible thing, I think that's what I heard in USC, but we may keep some sections online. Mm. Like let's say there's 100 classes of first year English, and we keep 20 classes online, and then let people choose. And who who will choose to be? Mm. Who lot, choose face to face? Who would choose face to face? Yeah, that's people well, would opt for online. They don't have to travel all the way to clear yeah. all the way. What, what happens uh, if some of, since uh, on campus? So. A lot too now on campus. But if most people choose to be online, maybe that's just, just the way it is. It's nothing to do with the pandemic. It's just the new norm for real. I, I see I'm a Padlet about new opportunities, about the online hybrid conferences and because I remember two or three years ago with the hub when we were trying to organize face-to-face -face sessions and it was so difficult to find the time and when we did a time then people didn't want to travel to Hong Kong you or Potty you or City you or whatever so the online we, we were very cautious at first about doing online but it's it worked out well like today we had up to 50 people attending and we've had a really good attendance so online PD sessions. I think it's something. It's a great opportunity. It's a great, yeah, yeah. yeah. And conferences, like the one conference, yeah. Conferences, I think, are a challenge still. Like to get people mm. still being um, active for the full conference, like the whole day or two days. That's difficult. People don't want to look at a screen for two or three days. But for like a two-hour session, yeah, it works. Jesus called the proposals. Is that online? Hybrid. Hybrid. We can choose. <laughs> 2022. Yeah, the, uh, the, yeah. the call for proposals is June 1st in the US, so there's still a little bit of time uh, um, mm. here for people to finish. Um, but they this year, for the first time, you have the option. You either submit for online or you submit for face-to-face. It's a good idea. Why is this very expensive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the beauty of conference, like okay, a international conference, would be socializing. Like okay, you try to network with people. It's much more difficult when it comes to online to network. Being able yeah. to travel. Yeah. <laughs> travel. Now, now <laughs> the universes are less willing to to sponsor. Hey, to sponsor, yeah. Yeah, I, I I think what uh, as what Adam said generally um, with the online opportunity, uh, people feel you know they're more comfortable with the you know taking PD opportunities online because it's so convenient and and uh, from our statistics also. Uh, we got really more people registering definitely and generally attending with the online sessions. So it actually has been quite interesting with the hub project in the last four years, half of it was really face to face and half uh, online. So interesting things to, to look at to do our um, evaluation and writing the report. Right. Um, aware of the time oh lucas just sent out the, the the link for the feedback if you could uh i mean it is just 5 30 uh if you could uh please take the uh, uh give us a uh, some feedback and uh i really want to thank again uh all of you here 
the presenters and also the uh, colleagues sharing your experiences, talking with each other. Uh, I mean, we could stay longer here, but I don't want to keep people here uh, longer if you have things to do. And uh, really, thank you for coming. This is our, as I said, this is our second last event. Uh, we have one more. Hope you you can also join us on Friday, uh, which we'll be talking about um, presentation. Actually, pre teaching presentation uh, online, and uh, that will be last the last event. And uh, we have um, this whole uh, session recorded and uh, we have been collecting the PowerPoints from colleagues a lot really for us to go back to have a look and learn from them and talk with our colleagues and share with our colleagues. So we have all the resources from the last four years uh, on the Hub website. So please um, get in and have a look and take and use and learn from each other. So um, thank you so much. Everybody here really have a great summer if you're not joining us on Friday, right? So um, let's still connect with each other and, um, and um, share with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.